Hi everyone, we're the Rumble Pack. Uh, I'm Adam, and Khaled is with me today, and we're gonna review Castlevania: Lords of Shadow 2. Uh, Hi everybody, I'm Khaled. Castlevania: Lords of Shadow 2 is the sequel to Castlevania: Lords of Shadow. You would be mistaken for thinking that was not the case. <laughs> Actually, I totally butchered that joke, but all right. Uh, <laughs> it's developed by Mercury Steam uh, for Konami. It is the sort of continuing adventures of Gabriel Belmont. Now, those of you who played the original Lords of Shadow are probably thinking, hey, Gabriel Belmont became Dracula at the end of Lords of Shadow 2. Yeah, that, that's that's all true. At the end of Lords of Shadow 1. Yeah, Lords of Shadow 1. I'm going to do that th through this whole review. Okay. Frankly. So, like, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to dub in my voice being like, Lords of Shadow. <laughs> over <laughs> over I fuck it up. That'll be awesome. So, yeah, you would be correct in believing that that is a thing that occurred. And, uh, Khaled, explain how the game deals with that. Well, the game, uh, opens up pretty much, uh, right where, uh, Lords of Shadow... No, it doesn't, it doesn't open up. It opens up with a bit of, uh, backstory. You know, explaining, uh, Mirror of Fate. Uh, the middle game in the series that was released on, uh, Game Boy... Or, no, 3DS. You know, they take you through a tutorial level where, uh, you know, Dracula fends off a horde of paladins because he's Dracula. That's what he does. People see just castle. He kills them. It's kind of his thing. And then the game opens up pretty much right where Lords of Shadow 1 ends with our emaciated, decrepit hero um, wandering out into the world to see how everything's going to go down. And go down it does. You know, going ahead and relaying some story from the very beginning of the game is fine. Basically what happens is it's like, okay, yeah, this is what happens in Mirror of Fate, and uh, blah, 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 Dracula kills his kid. It's all good. Like, it's fine. Nobody here played Mirror of Fate except Khaled. No one cares. Oh. I care. And he turns his kid into, into Alucard. You know, it starts out and it's like, hey, you're going to go out into the world, and then sort of one of the very first things it makes you do is uh, you drink the blood from an entire family. The thing that struck me about it, though, is it's like, hey, we're going to force you into first person and you're going to, like, murder this family, including the child. And, uh, well, it doesn't make you murder the child, but he totally does. Yeah. So it's like, hey, just in case you were forgetting, you are the bad guy. You know, you, you drink people's blood. Douche. You uh, are the Prince of Darkness. Yeah, exactly. You are Dracula. Just in case you forgot, you, you know, this is, this is what you do. This is what you do to people. Aren't you? Don't you feel ashamed? You gross piece of shit you <laughs> you know which is pretty cool uh i guess it i didn't feel super fantastic at the end of it but i guess that's kind of the point right yeah just makes you feel bad for doing it so after that you're like okay well we're gonna go out into castlevania city yes the city is called castlevania don't question it i don't I don't have an answer. Like, I question I question a lot of decisions in this series, but the biggest of which being that the humans are like, hey, you know what? Let's build our city on the ruins of Dracula's castle. <laughs> yes. The fuck are you doing? Like, that's like building your shit, your house on a fucking Indian burial ground. Haven't they seen Poltergeist? This is bad things. Always bad things will happen. Nothing right. good comes from this. You move the headstones, but you didn't move the bodies. Exactly. You know, you're in Dracula's castle now, city. I want to tell you that, like, it, it was a beautiful decision to do that. And I think conceptually it is a beautiful decision. But the way it actually plays out, it's pretty bland. Like, for the first ten hours or so, it's like, yeah, this is fantastic. I love this. And then you start item collection, and all you can... And that's kind of when the cracks start to show, in my opinion. I mean, item collection has always been iffy in the Castlevania game. A Metroidvania game, sorry. But it, yeah, in this one, when you add the 3D element to it, it just kind of... It's hard. You know, I think the biggest issue is, you know, once you start item collection, you start to realize how small the world actually is. Like, it... At first, it comes out and it's like, oh, this is this is awesome. This is huge. It's this whole city. And you really do feel like you're part of this living city. But then you start to realize, like, oh, this entire city is, like, maybe 20 areas. And really, it's, like, the only only the tourist brochure parts of the city. Yeah, the arts district. 
the yeah, science district. The science district. Downtown. <laughs> downtown. Castlevania City has the smallest downtown I've ever seen in my life, just for the well, record. To be fair, a lot of it is broken and on fire. That's true. So basically, it's like, okay, yeah, you need to, now that you have your strength, well, you don't have all your strength, but now that you have some of your strength, you need to defeat the Acolytes of Satan before Satan comes back. Okay, fine. Like, that's, that's oh, all right. Uh, I thought we already did this, but okay. Uh, and of course, as, you know, because they can't resist making a political statement, they're like, oh yeah, by the way, the Acolytes of Satan run, like, a huge chemical company, a huge arms manufacturer, and, like, the church. The church. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, oh, okay, right, yeah, you you could have maybe done something a little more interesting with that, but all right, I, I guess. kind of hit the nail right on the head there, didn't you guys? I guess the entire conceit of this game was like, hey, let's bring Dracula into the modern world. But for a game where it's like, hey, this is the central conceit of this game, you spend an awful lot of time in a fucking broken-ass medieval castle. Did you notice that? I did. To be fair, though, the broken-ass medieval castle was... Very impressive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not even going to bullshit on that. The broken-ass medieval castle was, like, way better than the city. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, because even though it felt small, it's like you kind of expect a broken-ass medieval castle to, to feel small. Um, and I think that it was also helped by the fact that even though it was a broken-ass medieval castle, there was still a lot more contiguous areas to actually traverse. As opposed to the city where it was like, okay, we're going to run through what basically amounts to a linear corridor full of enemies, and then we're going to go through a door, and we're going to go to another linear co linear corridor full of enemies. Whereas the castle felt much more open than that. Now we're, now we're, in, a ha now we're in a warehouse. Now yeah. we're in a warehouse. Now we're in a warehouse. No, the castle, like, the castle definitely felt connected. Like, even as you're traversing the different parts, like, there were a few times where I was running around one section of the castle... And I was like, oh, I haven't been down this hallway. And I'd go down that hallway, and I would take an elevator and then be like, oh, you're in this other part of the castle now. It's like, huh. Yeah, I mean, basically a castle, that castle felt a lot more like what a Metroidvania map is supposed to feel like in terms of connectedness, in terms of backtracking and all of that. Um, right. It was much better than the city. Uh, the world map doesn't exist. The world map does not exist. It is probably the first Metroidvania game in history that does not have a world map. What the fuck? The the world map, quote unquote, as it exists in uh, the game, is you open your book and there's a button. It says world map. You hit world map and it shows you the four districts of the city and how many collectibles are in those districts. And where your main mission is. Don't forget that. That's important. <laughs> and where your main mission is. It'll say, you were supposed to be in this district. <laughs> but that's it. Um, and I will admit, it took me an, embarrassing, an embarrassingly long amount of time of my playthrough to even find that. Yeah. And what that essentially means is, you are looking at area maps all of the time, which is basically what shows up on your fucking radar. Yeah, because Mini Dracula map. has radar. Uh, mini map yeah. radar. Uh, That's sonar. Right. Okay. Come on. All right. All right. All right. He has a mini map, um, and it's basic. It's almost exactly the same map. The only difference is you can see the whole thing instead of having it scroll with you. But exits are not marked unless it's the one you're supposed to go through. Uh, connections are not marked unless they're the one you're supposed to go through. Um, and there is no way you can zoom out and even see just, like, an entire district map, right? Which is f fucking ridiculous. I cannot impress upon you how fucking ridiculous this is. Now that we're done bitching about the world map, uh, let's talk about a couple, a few good things. Uh, the graphic, the game's beautiful, at least on my PC. I don't know how it looked on yours. Uh, um, I mean, I'm, I'm running a, what, a GTX 460? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it looked really good. Um, I didn't notice any screen tearing or, um, yeah, artifacting. It was all just, it was all smooth. It was all beautiful. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you saw the same thing. Dracula's hair was kind of... Yeah. Just, just hair is always weird. Yeah. Yeah, everything looked great on my PC. Um, especially because of my monitor. So, it, it looked really good. The sound design was pretty great, too. Um, 
the sound effects were all good. Like, attack sounded really satisfying for the most part. You know, when you got, like, a really good, like, heavy hit combo on some motherfucking crazy Abaddon-like demon, it was like, yes, mm, this is exactly what I need out of life. Uh, and the score, oh, the soundtrack is beautiful. Like, this is the first game in a long time that I can remember had, like, a fully orchestral score. And, like, the entire time I was thinking, man, why did we stop doing this? This sounds fucking great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why? Why did we stop? Don't know. But it was beautiful. No, the music, the music in this game is really good. The sound effects are great. And then, uh, I mean, the only place we can go from there is the voice acting. If you were a main character, your voice acting in this game was pretty great. Robert Carlyle... With a few notable exceptions. Robert Carlyle and Patrick Stewart, as always, just killing it. And then, you know, when Patrick Stewart wants to, Patrick Stewart starts chewing scenery so for me it's hard to talk about the voice acting without talking about the writing first we'll we'll talk about the story in just a second but the actual writing of the dialogue for the most part was pretty solid there were a couple of points where it was just like really like that's what you went with and <laughs> there were a couple of points where it just like i felt really bad for the scenery because it was just getting mercilessly torn to pieces uh by both robert carlisle and patrick stewart at a couple yeah. of different points you know, all in all, the writing, like the actual writing of the dialogue is pretty good. It's just there are a couple of standout moments where you're just, if you take a step back, you're like, Eesh. like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. But I just really like, like, to put it, to put it in like nerdy terms, hearing uh, Rumpelstiltskin and Captain Picard just bicker back and forth at each other was always good to me. <laughs> That's a decent enough segue into the story. The story itself yep. is pretty much fine. It goes exactly where you think it's going to go for the most part, with one notable exception that we'll get to later. Which, to me, actually makes it better than the original Lords of Shadow, because, as you know, Khaled, I have a big beef with Lords of Shadow, where it just kind of is like, hey, we're going to take a 90-degree turn with zero telegraph whatsoever, and you yep. can eat, eat a dick if you don't like it. So, I mean, overall, like... It's fine. I'm not going to say it's the best story I've ever heard and I've ever seen in a video game, but it's good. It gets you from point A to point B. At no point are you really like, oh, why is this guy doing this again? That makes no logical sense whatsoever. Right. No, the story, um, the story's pretty good, um, for the most part. Um, I especially liked, um, the one part probably about seven eighths into the game where they, they start wrapping everything up, and they're like, okay, this is how it all went down. And I was like, ah, ah. So I guess we need to talk about, we've avoided talking about it, the mechanics and the uh, controls. The controls are fluid. They're great. No problems. Uh, game says use a controller. Use a controller. Yep. Um, so we probably both i have no idea how the pc controls work or the keyboard controls are how do, what about you Colin? no idea i have an xbox controller yeah so as i said in my guacamelee review we do not penalize games that tell you to use a controller if the pc controls are bad chances are we don't even use them which is exactly what happened here because frankly if they tell you to use a controller and you don't use a controller you're just being stubborn and obstinate right so mechanically everything is it's all very solid. Combos flow together well. Um, the mastery system is really cool. Mastery system... Well, actually, you know what? You, you explain the mastery system. So the mastery system... Um, there's three levels of mastery for every weapon. You get three weapons over the course of the game. Um, and the mastery system... Uh, as you use a combo, it fills up. Um, and then once you master a move, you can dump that into the weapon... And then I assume the weapons become more powerful. They do. Like, I didn't really pay attention to that. It was just like, oh, I mastered another move, dump it into my whip. I mastered another move, dump it into my sword. You know. So I guess this would be a good time to bring that up. Um, the UI is somewhat customizable in this game. Yeah. Um, you can tell it to show damage numbers. Um, show damage you take 
show healing you get. Um, you can tell it to show the mastery of your weapons, which I turned on because I liked knowing that. Like, it shows the percentage right underneath your health bar of how much mastery you're at with a weapon. And as you hit things, you see how much you get with a particular move or a particular enemy. But uh, the mastery the mastery numbers in particular were very useful. Um, so anyways, like, as you... Like, so the game rewards you for using different combos. Like, yeah, you could, in theory, make it through the entire game just by hitting... Uh, well, let me look at my controller. X, 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 X? Yeah, five Xs. You would not do very well. But you would not do very well. <laughs> so it does reward you for doing different combos and different weapons. Uh, and of course, much just like in Lords of Shadow, you have two kinds of magic. You have chaos magic and void magic. Void magic heals you. Chaos magic does extra damage and does fire and all of that. In this game, chaos magic has an extra use, which is to be able to break armor of enemies. Uh, I like it. I think that it makes you mix up your magic use, though it really sucks to fight something when you don't have the correct type of magic. That didn't happen to me too often once I really got my magic bars upgraded to a decent point. I remember at one point I was in a fight and I was, well, actually it was in the very last fight. Uh, I probably had my void sword going pretty much the entire time because I had effed up really hard in the first part of the fight <laughs> and uh, I, kept, I needed the healing. But the thing is, I probably beat that fight on like about an eighth of a health bar uh, that I just kept refilling with the void magic. And, you know, I did beat it. So that says something for how awesome the void magic is. The magic feels appropriately powerful in this game. And it goes back to the old dichotomy of ice and fire. Like the void magic is supposed to represent like ice and like there's descriptions in the game about how it's like from the depths of his soul and all the coldness he feels and whatnot. But basically, it's ice and fire. That's all good. You I can didn't also use drink like, blood from enemies. Right. That's, yeah. Go you're ahead, never sorry. you're never in real danger of dying in this game, unless it's a boss fight, because if you're fighting little dudes, almost assuredly you can grab one of them and just tear into them and get a part a chunk of health back. Um, you know, the hardest enemy that I found in the game was actually the medium sized demons. Yeah. Because you couldn't grab them and drink their blood, right? And they were fast, like the little guys. Like, they were probably the worst. And then what was funny is, like, the little guys are just, like, bullshit. Like, they're, they're, they're whip fodder, if you will. Right. Get that? You like yeah. That? Uh... Whip fodder. Uh, and then the big demons are just so slow. Like, it's like you can fucking... You can hit them, like, four times. And then you can go and, like, play a game of chess with yourself before they recover and they're ready to go. So... <laughs> Um, I wouldn't say it's quite that bad, but no, yeah. the bigger it's like the bigger the enemy, the easier it was to take down. Whereas the li and the little dudes were really easy, but the both medium sized enemies were kind of a pain, like especially if you didn't have chaos magic when you're fighting the big knights. I guess that pretty much wraps things up, uh, except for one mechanic, which is you know we try not to look at reviews for games that we're going to review. Right. Uh, but we're only human, and we do make, make mistakes. This game did not Metacritic super well. And the reason this game did not Metacritic super well can probably be traced to a single section that occurs about, what, would you say halfway? Yeah, about halfway through the game. And it is a quote-unquote forced stealth section. Well... We've discussed this previously, and we do not agree that the stealth sections in Castlevania Lords of Shadow 2 are actually stealth sections. Uh, and the reason we do not agree they are actually stealth sections is because they're clearly not. Uh, would you like to explain that? Uh, yeah, it's pretty simple. The game, the game usually breaks down exactly what you need to do in, a, in one of these stealth sections, and at that point, it becomes an environmental puzzle. Like, go over here, hit this switch go over there, hit this switch. Oh, but don't get seen by the guard. Uh, and uh, the game gives you plenty of tools to, to deal with this, and they only there's only like four of them in the whole game. Maybe five. I think there's five. I think there's five. And the fourth one being the, the one that everybody yeah. talks about. And for me, I did not have 
a problem with the fourth one. I did actually have a bit of a problem with the fifth one, but that was just because, you know, the, the issue with the fifth one isn't so much that the puzzle is hard. It's that the margins are really low on it. So if you make any real mistake, you're probably fucked. The margin for error in that one was kind of low, but I I made it through that one pretty... I think it took me like four tries. I mean, like it. We're not talking like I was stuck for hours. Right. About this like I, it just was the one that was the most difficult for me. Uh, right. Um. The one that was the, the fourth one was the most difficult one for me, and that is because I guess I underestimated how much he would stick to me. Right. The fourth one probably took me about two or three tries to get through the very first area, but once I got through the very first area, right. That was it. It was fine. The rest of it just kind of fell into place pretty quickly. I think that the biggest quote-unquote sin that they committed during that fourth puzzle was they did not tell you about the bells until you died once, at least on my playthrough. Right. Uh, no, they didn't tell me about the bells until I had I had lost once, once or twice on mine. The like the only the only reason I I think reviewers had a problem with the section is because they try to brute force it and you can't. Yeah, it is probably it is pretty much the only style section that you pretty much can't cannot brute force. Uh, you have to do exactly what it tells you to, otherwise you will not get through. Now I don't think I did exactly what it told me to. I did use a lot of shortcuts, but that's because. I figured out pretty quickly that one of my abilities made it so I didn't make any sound as I crossed certain areas. And that's, to be honest, I think that's what the objective of that particular stealth section. It was like, hey, we're going to teach you how to use this thing that you just got. It's pretty great. Um, so I guess let's get to our big argument that we're going to have, and then let's do our wrap-up. Okay. All right. All right. The ending of this game is deeply unsatisfying. I would disagree. I would say that the ending of this game isn't anything special. It's it's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad. It's just flat. I would disagree because it, you know, the way I described it to you was the game makes you a promise and then it continues to make you this promise for approximately 15 hours. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think my own entire playthrough took about... 14, 15 hours. It continues to make this promise to you for 15 hours, and then at the very end of it, it's like, you know what? Never mind. And then it's over. And it is so frustrating. Because, you know, like, we were talking about it before we did this review, and basically what I told Khaled was if they had telegraphed it better, if they had said, uh, oh, he's, exper he's changing his mind, right? Like, just a little bit, then it would have been less frustrating. But it really does just kind of come out of nowhere with, in my opinion, no justification. Uh, Khaled thinks there is a justification, but he can tell you about that. Um, and it just kind of ends the game and is like, we're going to end it in the most unsatisfying way possible. Eat both my dicks. <laughs> Like I said, I didn't find the ending quite that bad, and Dracula's motivations at the end are not as unclear as uh, you think they are. At the, at the beginning of the game, when the promise was made to Dracula, Dracula was just like, you know what? Yeah, that's cool. I'm kind of tired of this nonsense anyways. But then by the end of the game, he's grown a bit as a Dark Lord. You know, he's gained some things, some important things to him. And, uh, you know, he just doesn't feel like it anymore. Well, and the thing is, though, like, those things that he gained would probably be totes cool. You know, like, they'd be like, yeah, I, I want that too. Let's do that. And that's what bothers me so much about it is because, you know, if it was... I mean, fuck, man, I can fix this in five seconds. Like, hey, you don't need to do that thing because, like, I think we can do some good and we should do that good. So, yeah, let's do that. Boom. Done. Like, five seconds of dialogue. I've fixed the problem with the game. That's probably why I found it so unsatisfying, is because it was so easy to fix. And that's all they needed to do, was just 
give some justification for it. Like, let's be honest here. Like, I know you didn't play Mirror Fate. I did. Mercury Steam, not so great at closing the deal. Like, the ending of Lords of Shadows 1 was very... Heh. Like, especially with the after credit scene the way it was. And then this this game didn't even have an after credit scene. It was just like, that's it. Yeah. Game over. Uh, and, I mean, I don't want to speculate too much, but I think the reason... I, I personally believe that the reason the game ended the way that it did is because Konami interfered. Uh, I think, you know, Mercury Steam was like, yeah, this is going to be the last game in the series. We're not going to make any more. And we want to end it this way. And I think that Konami came in and was like, yeah, if you do that, it's going to make it really hard for us to make DLC and possibly follow-up sequels. So you're not going to do that with our intellectual property. And that may be me being unfair to Konami, but that's really the only reason I could think of that they made what was very clearly not the intended ending the ending. Well, as since I finished the game yesterday, I was reading message boards and there have been a few topics that have popped up already saying that people have found DLC files in the files already. Of course. Um, which, you know, that playable character I want to be a playable character. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, so that's pretty much what we're going to talk about for the ending. So uh, it's deeply unsatisfying. Khaled says it's not. Uh, I would also like to add the caveat that, in my opinion, it's actually still worth playing, even even though, even in spite of, it's still worth playing. But it definitely, in my opinion, knocks it down a few pegs. You know, it, it, I just felt like it was a giant middle finger. And that's the thing that bugs me so much about it, is it's like, oh, you invest in this, you invest in this story. Fuck you. <laughs> We've got your 60 bucks. <laughs> We've got Eat my dick. Uh, disclaimer, we only paid 54 for it because we pre-ordered it on Steam. Yeah. Or is it 53? One 54. of those. 54. It was 53.99, I think. <laughs> yeah. Let's do the wrap-up. Okay. So... As we've said, we need to answer two questions. Who is this game for, and what games inform the creation of this game? It is through answering these questions we hope we can help you answer the third logical question, which is, how good is this game for you? Because it, the question can never be, how good is this game? That's too objective of, an, of a question. Right. So, Khalid, who is this game for? This game is for people that like a somewhat uh, rough but fair combat system. If you liked the original Lords of Shadow one, if you liked God of War, Devil May Cry 3, you'll feel right at home with these with this game. Okay, um, I'm going to challenge myself to do all of this without comparing it to God of War, okay? Okay. Do you think, that, do you think that's possible? That's, that's fair, because the combat in God of War is a little... a little more button mashy. Yeah. Well, and I'm just tired of people referring to it as a God of War clone, and I don't think that's an entirely fair accusation. It's not a God of War clone. I would say the influences of this game are, are lie more heavily with Devil May Cry. Yeah, I actually agree. And Darksiders. Yeah, uh, Darksiders. So, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So, Adam says this game is for people who like spectacle fighters. Spectacle fighters are a genre of fighters where the sort of focus isn't on the actual fighting itself, but the sort of, sort of how good it looks. The prototypical spectacle fighter is probably Devil May Cry 3. And now we have countless examples, things like DMC, Darksiders, um, you know, that they give you all of these tools to deal with these hordes of enemies that they throw at you, and it's really satisfying to do it, and it looks really great at the same time. Um, but it's important that you realize that this game is a spectacle fighter through and through. If you do not like spectacle fighters, you will not like this game. That's true. So... I guess the question is, what games have formed the creation? Well, we've already mentioned Devil May Cry 3, DMC, Darksiders. Darksiders 2, to a lesser extent. Um, uh, what else? Uh, obviously, Lords of Shadow. The uh, yeah, original. Obviously, yeah, obviously, Metroid being a... Uh, yeah, it's... Like, Symphony of the Night is clearly a big influence here. Not as big as maybe we would have liked, but definitely there. You know, in terms of the magic system, I would love to tell you that it's very close to Ikaruga or the other sort of color-switching shooters, but it's not. Um, 
there are a few points where you have to switch colors, but it's not necessarily required. And the game does tell you, like, yeah, if you f if you freeze an enemy using the word magic and then you use, uh, like, your chaos claws on it, like, you'll do massive damage. Not true, as far as I could tell. <laughs> it, it's like, it's, you know, when, when a game says massive damage, I'm thinking, oh, like, this is going to be a Dark Souls-style, like, backstab. I'm just going to, like, hit this motherfucker and he's going to explode. No. <laughs> doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't. So it's not really as potent as they would like you to believe. So I can't tell you that it's like that, even though it kind of purports to be. Um, so I guess at the end of the day, uh, if you are one to rage at things that you see are stupid and uh, you hate deeply unsatisfied at unsatisfying endings, you're one to say, I don't need no instructions to know how to rock. And then you try to brute force stealth sections. You'll probably hate them. I was going to say, you'll hate the combat, too. The, the combat rewards you for learning how to block and dodge and time your attacks, not necessarily just to hit X over and over and over again, because you will get wrecked in the face. A yeah, lot. 100, 100%. And the game has synchronized blocking, and I just want to point out, I suck at synchronized blocking. I just don't do... I just don't have the timing for it. But I still like the game. The window, like, I I think the windows for the synchronized block in this game are very fair. Yeah, I like I said, I suck at them. Not synchronized blocking sucks. Oh. Adam sucks at them. Oh, Adam sucks at <laughs> synchronized blocking. Okay. <laughs> like, no, I wasn't trying to shit on synchronized blocking. I, I know it's fair. I just am not good at it. So, I guess the bottom line is, if you like Darksiders, DMC, other Spectacle Fighters, and... The original Lords of Shadow? The original Lords of Shadow, and... God of War, you'll probably like this game. And I guess that's kind of the bottom line, wouldn't you say? Yeah. That pretty nailed, that pretty much nails it. And uh, this has been an incredibly long review, even after editing. Oh, man, yeah. So I guess at the end of the day, we come down to the things we always tell you. Like it if you like it, dislike it if you dislike it. Comments are down below if you disagree. You can catch us on Facebook and Twitter at RumblePackLP. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye. Bye.